like when 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 I had all these tragedies, my son passing away, my brother-in-law passing away, my wife losing her her memory after a stroke, she got it back. My my foster kids being you know coming and going, uh, my kid getting hit by a car. I thought God hated me. Does God hate me? And then I started thinking, these things actually didn't happen to me, did they? They happen to people I love. I'm not going in some dark path because he loves all them too. I'm not going there, obviously. But what was happening is in my head, I was stringing them all together and applying it to me. And then I thought, obviously God doesn't hate me. Obviously this is just a place where things happen. And I should just love God unconditionally. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. My guest today is an award-winning author and serial entrepreneur. An executive coach to CEOs, he has been featured in Forbes, Bloomberg Business Weekly, Inc., Entrepreneur, and the Huffington Post. Pacific Business News recognized him as one of the top 40 under 40 best and brightest young businessmen in Hawaii. He is one of the world's leading thinkers and top 100 coaches, and he is a CEO and co-founder of Product a global entrepreneurship solution helping businesses go from idea to market with full service sourcing, product strategy, and end-to-end supply chain. He's the author of several books, including his brand new Anti-Time Management, The Power of Starting Something Stupid, and Resumes Are Dead, and What to Do About It. Born and raised in San Diego, and having lived in Brazil and Hawaii, he and his wife, Natalie, and They have four boys, one who has already made his way to heaven. They've also cared for three beloved foster children and live on the north shore of Oahu, Hawaii with their little dog, Velzi. I am pleased to present Richie Norton. Richie, are you ready to share your story of hope? I'm ready. I'm excited to be here. Let's make it happen. Rock and roll. Here we go. (laughs) Awesome. Now, I thought I'd break the ice with a story from when you were a teenager. And, you know, we all hit the age of 16 and we kind of say, okay, I'm 16. I can now work. And you were thinking of getting a job. And your dad gave you some advice that you thought was kind of counterintuitive, but it ended up working out. Would you mind sharing a little bit of that? Yeah, definitely. You know, I, every, every teenager wants to be able to spend money, right? Uh, You know, at at some point in time. And uh, I wanted to be able to kind of control that and have some. And so I asked my dad, you know, told him I wanted to get a job. And he said, you don't want a job. And I said, (laughs) "Uh, what kind of dad says that, you know? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I can't even imagine my father saying that when I was, well, he told me, he said, yeah, you need a job. (laughs) So let's hear what your dad said. Well, he said, you know, you're only going to be a kid once and you're gonna be working your entire life your job is to get good grades and have fun and you know uh, middle class family you know doing doing our thing it it wouldn't have hurt me to go and get a job somewhere and 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 have my own money and do my own thing but that when i tell a story from this angle it makes it sound like it is what it is that's not what he was saying at all what he Mm. is saying is it's okay if you want money and there is a way to get money, but working for minimum wage as a teenager, picking up trash at the, at the fairgrounds or working at, you know, the gas station may not be the best use of your time. That's what he was saying. Mm. (laughs) So he told me this crazy idea. He said, go to El Centro and where there's a lot of farms and go to the watermelon patch and and ask if you can buy the irregular sized watermelons that they can't sell to the stores and i'm like that's bizarre you know like like, where does he get these ideas and so my brother and i we we uh emptied out the family van took out the seats out of the back and headed over there you know several several hours away from where we lived and we we did my dad gave us a little bit of money seed money i call it and um, we bought these watermelons, filled up the van completely. The it was low riding hard, like hitting everything <laughs> that we <laughs> that we would roll over. 
And uh, we sold those watermelons on the 4th of July and ended up selling, basically made enough money in one day, um, more money in one day than we would have made working the entire summer for minimum wow. wage. And so when he said you don't want a job, he meant don't trade, you don't have to trade your time for money. He meant you can be creative. He meant you can be an mm. entrepreneur. He meant, you know, I, I all get that we want money, but money and meaning can go together. Why do we have to sacrifice our meaning for money? In fact, most people spend their lives chasing money, telling themselves they're doing it for meaning and they lose all meaning in the process. And he taught me that, you know, without, without even saying a word about it, he taught it by just sharing a new way of doing things. Uh, and so that's kind of uh, impacted my life in a number of different ways. Oh, it's so powerful. I mean, it really is uh, to lead by example that way. And I, I admire your father's wisdom in teaching you those those key ideas that actually kind of have become meaningful throughout your life, probably even more as you've had uh, bigger and better experiences as you've grown older. Now, there were two Gavins in your life that had a very strong impact on, on who you are and some of the principles that you've begun to live your life by. Would you mind sh sharing a little bit about them? My, my wife and I got married, li live in Hawaii. We have you know amazing children. And for about five years off and on, my brother-in-law lived with us. And without going into like all the crazy details, because it was just a shock to us that, you know, I, at the time, um, my brother-in-law passed away in his sleep at the age of 21. Wow. It was devastating to think that someone we know, someone we love, my wife's brother is, is gone and will never have a chance to grow old mm -hmm. and to do the things that we've always been taught in America that we can do, meaning work really hard for a long time and then be able to retire and live your life. Not possible. And when this happened, it really made us rethink, uh, not just that life is short, you know, the, that, that's cliche, but it doesn't make it any less true. You know, mm -hmm. life, life is short, but not just that it's short, but the opportunities we have that are right bef before us need to need to be done now, not mm -hmm. in, in the future when the future is elusive and possibly non-existent. In fact, we can never reach the future, can we? We're always in the present. No matter how much we think about the future, we're always physically <laughs> in the yeah. present. And so a few years later, my uh, uh, our fourth son, we named him Gavin after my brother-in-law, Gavin. Um, he was born and he gave us so much light and hope because we named him after his uncle. And so we thought of uh, him filling the hole in some, some little way. And it turned out uh, after some time, that he got this cough and the doctors said he was fine and it would be fine. And it, it persisted. They said he had RSV and they were wrong. He didn't have RSV and, and it persisted. And finally one night um, he was having a really hard time breathing and took him to the doctors again. We thought we'd be in and out of the emergency room um, and they kept us there. Eventually they um, looked for pertussis, uh, which is also known as whooping cough. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that's what he had. Wow. And it was just so much um, on his little body. I remember my wife and I just praying so hard and, 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 you know, asking the world to pray. And my wife, my wife blogging, there's even someone from, I think, Istanbul that said he stood up all night, you know, praying for our son. And we were expecting and hoping uh, a mir for a miracle. Uh, but I remember a nurse came in and she said, you know, uh, you need to stay the night, which was a, bizarre thing to say because we always stayed the night that wasn't a thing but she was cluing us in that this was the end and they took out all the little wires and all the tubes out of his body and i remember just holding him for a moment immediately handing him to my wife she's sitting on a rocking chair and i have my hand on his heart and and uh she's cuddling him and we just sing lullabies and we just wait for those last beats and he slips away and when this happened, of course, it's your worst nightmare as a parent. But my wife remembers, um, too, as we've talked about it, not realizing um, that she would ever have the strength to handle something like that. 
and whether it's her or the her inside of her, you know, this, this, um, something extra, something special, um, it, uh, it changed us. It changed us. And someone asked, you know, what do you, what'd you learn from your experience from your brother-in-law passing away from your son passing away? And I came up with something that I call Gavin's law, you know, in their name, which is live to start, start to live. Cause when you live to start those ideas that are pressing on your mind, you really will start living. So many people wonder what should they do, but they have this idea in their head and they don't do anything about it because they're scared. And they end up walking around like the living dead, not knowing what to do with their lives. When in reality, there's been something, some inspiration, something has been pressing for a long time and they still won't do anything about it. So the idea of live to start, start to live, Gavin's law um, has empowered me to be able to say, you know what? I have this idea. I'm not sure it's going to fail or not. Even if I'm worried if it's going to fail or not, I don't know. I want to live a life without regret. There are things in this life that are just so important. And not only are they important, they're timely. Mm-hmm. And, every, and every time I tell myself I need more time, I need more education, I need more experience, I need more money, I am only pushing. I'm only pushing the things that are in my head right now into the future where they'll be harder to do and probably never happen. Mm-hmm. So Gavin's law helps me to uh, live in the present, as they say, but also with a perspective that there are um, things, money and meaning, even bringing it back to that original story that you can do right now. And, uh, and you should. Absolutely. Wow. Such, first of all, I am sorry you had to go through several hard moments to learn those lessons, but wow. The power and how that has completely changed who you are and how you live is it's powerful. It's almost like you said, you, you decided, okay, their life had meaning and I can do uh, some amazing things in a short amount of time and take these dreams from the future and place them right here and, and uh, get them done. Now, you have a new book that is just come out, Anti-Time Management. And the whole kind of premise behind this is learning to manage one of our biggest commodities here on earth, and that is the principle of time. And some people call it time management, but you kind of go against that in this book and say it's it's not about time management. It's about deciding what we do with what we have and what we value. Would you mind talking a little bit about this this principle of time tipping and how we react to situations and change? Yeah, there is a time, if anybody uh, remembers, they may or may not remember, but there is a time where the whole world thought Hawaii was about to blow up from a ballistic missile uh, from North Korea. And I happened to be in uh, Nashville and my whole family was home and I get this text on my phone saying there's a ballistic, you know, missile and this is not a test. And in that moment, my, uh, so to speak, movie movement, you know, life flashed before my eyes, but in reality, it it actually kind of slowed down. And I thought of, you know, my two Gavins, you know, our, our two Gavins that passed away. But I also thought about our foster kids, you know, that, that, that you mentioned, I thought about. Uh, who would come and gone at, at this point, uh, who we love so much. And I thought about, I thought about my son got hit by a car and crossing, crossing the street and, and should, should be dead, but he survived and he's, you know, riding these gigantic waves out here in Hawaii. And I thought about my wife who had a stroke at one point and lost her memory. And I thought all these thoughts, and I thought, and now everything's going to be gone. The whole island's going to be wiped out and I'm never going to see my family again. And I didn't think, what was me? I thought, I'm so glad we live life without regret. That's what I thought. And it's interesting because when you experience hardships, um, the, the idea in anti-time management isn't that you're going to avoid them or that things you don't expect won't happen. The idea is to create space so that life becomes almost airy and available for you to make better choices under any circumstances. So like for me, all these things bring grief, 
And for our listeners, I'm sure they've experienced grief, whether it's small or big, there's no comparing. It is what it is. They, they say like a little bit of gas in a room fills the whole room, a little bit of pain, a little bit of turmoil, a little bit of whatever can fill your entire body, your mind. It, it can, it can, it can just encompass you and make everything even feel debilitating. So what I see time as, um, and grief specifically as a tunnel, not a cave, um, that, that, uh, that it may be hard and it is hard and it's okay to feel bad when you're feeling bad. And it's okay to sleep in when you're sleeping in and uh, to avoid punishing yourself, you know, when, when you're feeling good, but when it comes to my last book, the power of starting something stupid and starting these so-called stupid ideas, which I think are the new smart. Right. And I learned that people would say, I have a stupid idea, Richie, and I wanted to do it. And I go, cool. And it wasn't hard to help somebody align their idea with money-making it's a matter of sales at that point. It's a transaction. Mm -hmm. You can have a transformational business, but at some point money-making is a transaction and that's not difficult. It's difficult to do, but it's not difficult in concept. So when you run someone up like this, this, this path to make money, when you type in goal setting on the internet, you're going to find some, some dude in a suit with a flag climbing a mountain. It's bizarre. Uh -huh. It's bizarre. Uh -huh. It makes no sense. And people all think that that is the way we do it. And so when I think about anti-time management and I tie it to the, the power of starting something stupid, you know, in this conversation, living without regret, I think, hmm, are all the things I'm doing actually accomplishing the thing that I want? Because when someone tells me they want to start a business, let's just do one. It's a pen, let's pretend it's a pencil business just for the sake of, of doing something really vanilla, right? They didn't want the pencil business. They wanted what they thought would come from the success of the pencil business. Mm. This is a metaphor. So people will set goals and they'll run towards them really far and they'll reach it and they'll be dissatisfied because it wasn't what they wanted. They thought they would get something from getting that goal. What's the job of the goal? To me, goals aren't goals at all. Goals aren't ends. Goals are means to an end. Goals are means, strengths are means, habits are means. The idea is to move beyond them and beyond the goals, beyond, beyond the strengths, beyond the habits is where anti-time management lives. It's the success after the success. It's why we do the things that we do. It's the essence of the reason that we do the things we do. So when someone said they want to start, for example, a pencil business, it wasn't hard to help them make money and sell a bunch of pencils. But when they didn't have the time and freedom to do what they really wanted to do, which was actually travel the world, spend time with their family, coach the kids sports, it changes the entire business. Because all you'd have to do is say, oh, you want to travel the world and spend time with your family and you want to coach your kids sports? Why don't we start there hmm. and build a pencil business that supports that goal? Mm -hmm. Or once you realize that's the goal, you don't need a pencil business at all. You might not even need to quit your job. You seem mm -hmm. to rearrange what you're doing. So anti-time management goes like this. Time management, what we know. Time management means they control your time. Anti-time management means you control your time. Time management means they tell you what to do. Anti-time management means you decide what you want to do. Time management means they take up space. Anti-time management means you create space. And I'm not saying that like it's some, some thing. I'm saying this literally from 200 years ago when time management was invented. This is an invention. This is a man-made invention. It was designed specifically as a tool to control people. Every blood, every drop of blood, sweat, and tear is measured. Every motion of your arm is measured. That is time management. So the idea of time management entering the vernacular of self-help is a bizarre concept because it has nothing to do with helping you as everything with controlling you. And mm -hmm. so anti-time management moves us away from the, the misconceptions we have about time management and brings us to what we really want, which is uh, living the essence of what we want. One more, one more example is if you bake a cake without sugar, you can't expect it to be sweet. <laughs> you know, you can put in other kinds of things to make it sweet. I get it. But Time management is like baking a cake without sugar and expecting it to give, to give you time. 
It's better mm-hmm. to bake in the sugar from the start. It's better to bake in the values from the start. Start. How can you expect to, to have a life not lived with values and eventually have your values? So the idea is to um, value your time, not time your values. Time management instantly tells people to time their values. I want this thing. It's a priority. I'll do it last. That's, mm. that's weird. I have this value. I'm going to work for it for my family. One day in the future, I will do it. That's weird. Why not bake in the time, the essence, the love, the values from the very start? Because when you do, you actually in, you encourage and create systems that support not only your personal values, but it removes you as a bottleneck from the way you work and allows you to be able to do your actual work better and more, more productively instead of having your work take you away from what you want to do. Your work brings you closer to it. Wow. That is so powerful. I just, I just finished reading your book and, and my first thought as I finished it was I need to sit down with my husband and like Mm -hmm. say, okay, what are our goals? (laughs) What are we working towards? You know, and, and, and really sit down and, and kind of apply what, what you teach in this book. Um, I know I loved three of the questions in particular that I think were about in the middle of the book where you said, what would I do if I only had an hour to get this done? And it kind of helps you get rid of all the fluff and really pairs it down to, okay, what is most important? Because I think we, we often spend our time spinning our wheels, doing things that really aren't important and not focusing on what matters most to us personally. And the second one was, what would I do if I could only work an hour a day? And what would I do if I worked only an hour a week? And I just sat there pondering those. Like, I think I literally stopped and I wrote them down and I was like, what the heck? Where's this been all my life? <laughs> yeah. what, what did you, what did you, what did you decide you do? <laughs> oh, you- well, it, you know, it, it really made me think because when, when I started podcasting, I think I felt like I needed to open up my entire schedule to allow time for people to pod, you know, bring people into interview. And it's so interesting here. I am three and a half years into it going, I only record now on these days at these times. And, and if people can't fit it in, I'll, I'll make exceptions, you know, every once in a while, but it's interesting how I went from, I will record from nine in the morning till nine at night when everybody else can to really saying, no, that's not what's most important in my life. What's most important in my life are, is my husband and my children and taking care of them. And since I have two kids on the autism spectrum, you know, they demand a lot of my time. And so making sure that I prioritize, okay, they need my help at these times of the day. And so really prioritizing what is most important to me and then, okay, for my business, what do I really need to have happen and fitting that in. And so it just really made me, I think I've started coming to those same conclusions that you teach in the book slowly, probably should have learned it faster, Richie, I'm telling you, but, um, But I'm thankful that at least I can see progress in my own story. Uh, As I read this, I'm like, yes, I am doing better at valuing myself and my time, cutting things out that just want to take over, want to control and say, no, that's really not important. That's gone. Um, And uh, implementing, I love how you talk about love in the book that what we spend our time on is what we love. Um, prioritizing what we love, I guess, is the way you say it, I think. And uh, so it's, it's truly powerful and, and it gives life meaning. You, you know, we've talked about meaning a little bit. So um, I'm thankful. Yeah. I'm thankful for that. You know, I, I I took a lot from it and I feel like I need to go back and really study the questions and go, okay, how can I do better with this? Because I know that I have so many areas in which I can improve. (laughs) Yeah, no. Yeah. We all, we all do. We all do. I, I just think it's fascinating that people will either start a business or go to a job telling themselves they're doing it for their family at the 
actual expense of their family. Yes. I think it's so weird. It's bizarre. How does that make any logical sense? And it, it does make logical sense because we tell ourselves it does. But in reality, how we show up is a very different thing. You know, they'll, they'll say, I want to create a business that has, gives me more time only to lose all their time into the business. So that's because they measured for that. They used time management. They said, mm -hmm. I have to do these things first so I can have this thing later. Instead of saying the thing I want later, I can bake in from the start. Mm -hmm. It completely changed everything you do. And, and, and yes, of course, you know, someone working in a nine to five could potentially depends on the nature of the job could potentially do the same work that from nine to five could do it from nine to 10. And why do they take longer? Because that's how they're measured. They're supposed to be in the seat. They have to stretch it out. It's the way it works. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and if they shorten it, their boss will give them more work and not more pay, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is, this is the world we live in and everybody plays this little dance. That's cool. So I'm not saying like um, what what's happening isn't real because it's real. What I'm trying to say is stop lying to yourself about what you're doing, reaching your goal when it won't, when it won't. And then two, recognize there is another way and it is a choice. It is a choice. And if you can then act on that choice, you might be able to uh, live that life you were hoping would come five or 10 years from now immediately. And I'm not saying that like philosophically, I mean, literally that, that Italy trip you guys want to do in two years could be done and booked today, but you told yourself all these other things have to happen first. It's probably not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's probably not true. And, and the happy, the happy part on the professional side is now you get to figure out how to do work in a way that actually supports your life. Mm. Instead of, yeah. instead of, you've already figured out how to sacrifice your entire life for your work. You, are, you, you figured that out from the day you were born. We were, we were told to do that mm -hmm. every day, kindergarten, preschool, all the way up, 12th grade, college, sacrifice your entire life so you can one day have one. You can do the opposite too, just a matter of learning. Yeah. And I, and I love how you talked about it being a matter of choice. Um, you share a story in the book that really was powerful to me, especially since I interview people who have gone through challenging things. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, we'll have more lessons, tips, and things you can apply to your life. Stay tuned. Hey, my friends, it's Tamara K. Anderson, and I need your help. I am gearing up for a wonderful Christmas season this year, and I need your stories to be part of it. I'm launching a new part on my podcast that I'm going to start doing every holiday season called Holiday Stories of Hope. And so I would love to hear your stories that you and your family have had happen to you during the holidays that have inspired hope in Christ, hope in your family, stories that perhaps you've passed down for generations, or perhaps it's something that's happened to you personally. So if you have a story you would love to share, if you wouldn't mind coming on a Zoom call with me and recording it, we can do it in 5, 10, 15 minutes. And then I will be sharing that this November and December with my audience so that we can all be inspired by your story of hope. If you're interested, go to my website, TamaraKAnderson.com and go to contact me and reach out to me that way and we'll get something set up. All right, guys, thanks for being such great supporters. And I look forward to sharing more of your stories of hope. You share a story in the book um, that, that really was powerful to me, especially since I interview people who have gone through challenging things in their lives. And um, I'm going to forget her name. The rapper. What was her name? Osira. Oh, yeah. That's it. Thank you. I'm like, it begins with an S. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's amazing. She's amazing. So yeah. I loved that she had had such a difficult and challenging life, you know, grew up dad addicted to drugs. She was too. And then she had a pivotal moment where she, she heard a voice saying, this isn't who you are. I'm paraphrasing of course, but yeah, you're um, you were meant to rap. You were meant to sing and going in and following that dream and trying to figure out how do I do this? It, it gave her purpose to get off drugs. It gave her purpose to follow this, even though she sucked at it at the beginning. And 
she was able to move forward towards that dream and accomplish it. It, it was such a powerful story. And I thought this, this is a great example of choice, you know, saying she could have lived as a victim her entire life, but she instead said, okay, I'm going to stand on this as a platform and say, this is where I came from, but it doesn't have to be who I am forever. That's, that's right. And the I am part is really, really important um, because she never had the chance to go to recitals growing up. She would never have a chance to go to the summer camps that, you know, we send our, our kids to. Uh, she would never be able to go through the whole protocol of learning and goal setting and getting a, a literal gold star and, and getting an award and getting a trophy for being 14, 15, 16 year old singer person. That was never mm -hmm. going to happen. But when she decided she was a rapper, she showed up as one and became one and eventually earned a Grammy. Mm -hmm. When most of us juxtaposition, no matter where we are in life, no matter how hard it was in the past, would say, oh, no, I need those gold stars first. Mm. I, need, I need my recitals first. I need my lessons first. And we eventually go down five or 10 years or longer and never end up doing it because we keep telling ourselves we need something. I will do something as opposed to I am something. Therefore, I do something. So mm. thinking from what, I, what Aristotle called final cause, thinking from beyond the goal, the essence of the goal, thinking from your future self changes the way you work as opposed to saying I one day will become this thing. Um, which leads us down the path we already know and are familiar with, because that's the way most people live their entire lives. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I was telling you before we jumped on the recording that I, I just got back from a uh, author training with Richard Paul Evans. And, and I was having this exact conversation with one of my friends down there at the ranch. And, and he's been working on a book for quite a while. And he said, I still can't call myself an author. And I'm like, hello, you've been writing for so long. He's like, I just can't do it. I said, you are an author. You need to claim it. He's like, and it, it, it's kind of like we have these self-imposed hurdles that, that are holding us back. Like, I'm like, how long have you been writing? I mean, you're, you're getting your PhD right now. You're writing a dissertation. I'm like, you're an author. <laughs> yeah. You're an author in so many ways, just because you haven't publish this particular book doesn't mean you haven't been writing for years and decades of your life. I'm like, you're an author, claim it, but it's hard, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, when I, I, I interviewed hundreds of people that were approaching retirement and some of them were successful. Some of them quote unquote, weren't, I think they had great lives either way, but they, I would ask them like when things worked or didn't work, what was the difference? And they would say, this is kind of the, the, the refrain hey, that, 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 would, that would come through. They would say, I thought I needed more time. I thought I would wait till I had more time, more education, more experience, and more money to do what I really wanted to do. Only to find out that now that I'm here in this spot I always was waiting for, I still need more time, more education, more experience, and more money. Now, whether that's just psychological or, or like literal, I guess that would be circumstantial, but in the end, those who began where they were with what they had or didn't have were able to far exceed those who waited for more because they were able to leverage resources that were out there that the others decided to completely ignore or not believe that they had access to. Mm. Totally different way of living. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, we don't want our dreams. We don't want our dreams in the future. Think about who you were 10 or 20 years ago. You don't have to say this out loud, but like, think about who you were. It's 2022. Let's pretend it's 2012. Who were you? You were a different person. You had different totally. money. You had different circumstances. You had different goals. You don't even want those goals you had back then. No. It, it's better to go after the goals you want right now and, and the ones you think you want in the future and bring them in now so you can build on top of them. And people aren't that scared of failure. People, we, say, we, say, we say people are scared of failure, but we've talked about it so much in, in, in the world, fail forward, fail fast. You learn that it's like, okay, I got it. Failing is part of the process. Cool. What people are really scared of is looking bad. 
their it's ego, it's pride. They're scared of slow growth. This will take too long for my people to validate me. Therefore, I feel like a failure, even though if they would just keep going, they'd be yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, this brings, brings me to kind of a, an important thing that I'm going to draw out of your book, but, but you don't talk about the spiritual component very much in your book, but I know you're a spiritual person. Um, sometimes God plants these dreams in our heart and they're big dreams. And, and I don't think he's going to plant something in there if he knows we can't accomplish it. And so my question to you is, I know you've had some ginormous dreams and goals that you've accomplished. How do you feel uh, leaning on God has helped you overcome perhaps our, our, our own fear of achieving these dreams and goals and maybe given you, helped you find the resources to accomplish them? I don't think any of us could ever know the mind of God well enough, right? Like when, when, when I had all these tragedies, my son passing away, my brother-in-law passing away, my wife losing her, her memory after a stroke, she got it back. My, my foster kids being, you know, coming and going, uh, my kid getting hit by a car. I thought God hated me. Mm. And I started asking myself, does God hate me? And then I started thinking, these things actually didn't happen to me, did they? They happen to people I love. I'm not going in some dark path because he loves all them too. I'm not going there, obviously. But what was happening is in my head, I was stringing them all together and applying it to me. Mm. And then I thought, obviously, God doesn't hate me. Obviously, this is just a place where things happen. And I should just love God unconditionally. Because every time people tie their faith to an outcome, they lose their faith every time they don't get an outcome. Sign seekers. And the greatest miracle of faith is having faith when there is no miracle. Boy, isn't that the truth? So I started telling myself, I'm going to love God unconditionally and go to work. I'm going to do what I, I, I – it gives you – you can have faith and give yourself back the power instead of just waiting. So big dreams, inspired or not. Big ideas, inspired or not. Timelines, inspired or not. You do what you can with what you have, where you are, and it creates processional effects and people come out of the woodwork. And you can't, in my opinion, stop attaching it to some divine thing, whether it works out or not. That's bizarre. Assign positive meaning to the situation, whether it works out or not. I assign positive meaning to my son passing away. It's the worst thing in the world. My wife and I told ourselves we wouldn't let it tear us apart we would try to live better because of him to bring us closer together that's how you assign meaning hmm. so it kind of goes back to what you were saying how you choose you make a choice on how you look at it yeah um and and that's powerful i love that no and, I, and i've seen that in my own life and there was a time that i really prayed that for several probably years that God would um, heal my boys from their autism. And yeah, it would have been so much easier if we hadn't had that struggle in our lives. But um, I think that was my, one of my biggest epiphanies one day was when I figured out that true faith is saying, I believe in you no matter the outcome. And I trust that you see the end from the beginning and that you're going to make all this work for my good like it says in Romans, <laughs> you know, that all these things will work for my good. I remember a friend pointing that out to me when I was a older teenager and, and really looking at it and not understanding it truly till later in my life when uh, I, I was going through a harder time that I, I prayed God would save me from, <laughs> but <Yeah>. he didn't. <laughs> no, no I, I, I love it. And, you know, it's, it's always frustrating to anyone who's gone through a hard time uh, to hear this whole idea of have more faith. Sure, why not? Um, but if you, if you, if anyone who studied the scriptures knows those people had terrible lives for the most part, yeah. many of them were killed. They didn't get anything they prayed for. <laughs> it's terrible. I, I mean, like, what, what are we making up? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of, of having faith and going to work and continuing to be assigned meaning to the things you're doing, even when there is no miracle, I respect those people. Yeah. 
Absolutely. This has been awesome. I, I appreciate you diving into this. Now, one of the phrases I loved in your book was move from prisons of time to prisms of time and basically creating projects that create time for you and don't take time away from you. What, what do you feel that means for all of us today? So uh, ask a better question, get a better answer, right? That's, that's the philosophy. And so when someone says, I want to do this thing, and they end up in a quote unquote, what I call prison of time, then they're there and they think that's the way it's supposed to be because they've been taught it's supposed to be that way. In fact, sadly, by corporations, it was designed to be a prison of time. Well, I don't want you going out and having fun doing your thing. You need to make me money corporations. We know this. Why, why do we think that time in a corporation is going to give someone a better life in their personal life? It doesn't make sense. So a prism of time would be ask a better question, get a better answer. How can I do this thing without this terrible thing happening that I'm worried about over this year, over these next six months? And even though you don't know the answer, you create a space or a prism for an abundance of options and opportunities to come out of one choice. So most people are making 10 different choices to try and get one outcome. Distractions. Mm -hmm. When in reality, they can make one decision that eliminates 100 other decisions and provides an abundance of different outcomes and opportunities and possibilities mm -hmm. just by asking a different question. So if you feel like you're stuck, ask a better question, get a better answer. Most people, so Stephen Covey, I'm a Covey person, you know, he said, begin with the end in mind. Children know this phrase now, okay? It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. He did not say begin with means in mind. And we're always constantly substituting means and making them ends unto themselves. Hmm. what's my goal what's my strength what's what's my habit means you could have any goal any strength any habit but the outcome that's different you know you want you want to be at the top of the mountain to see a sunset cool does that mean you have to scale it with ropes could you climb it like a normal person could you get on a donkey could you ride a bike could you drive on the road they paved to the top of it could you get a helicopter? See, once you realize the actual situation, you can change what you do. Oh, and by the way, maybe you didn't really want to be on top of a mountain of the sunset. You just wanted to uh, be with your kids somewhere watching a sunset. Well, now you got to bring your kids and maybe it doesn't have to be on a mountain. Maybe it can be on the beach. See, once you realize, Aristotle called it final cause. And academics will use this example of a table. They'll say final cause has four. There's four causes in Aristotle's philosophy here. And one is like you get these materials, you, 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 you have the form of what it's going to be, you have some, an agent put it together, and then it becomes this thing. So you get some wood, and then you, get some, you have some design of what it's going to look like. Someone puts it together, and all of a sudden you have a table. But in the modern world, like, right, I could, an acorn becomes an oak tree. In the, model, in the modern world, you say, what's the table for? Is it a legacy piece for my family every day for, you know, for the next several generations? Or do we just have something special happening in town and we can order Uber Eats or go to a food truck? Because now if the, if the actual goal was just to have a nice dinner with, with friends and family and loved ones, you don't need to spend any time or money on all this wood and wood building and craftsmanship that took away all your time and money completely unnecessarily. And yet we justify it. We justify it the means because they think it got us to an end when in reality the end could have happened with none of those means. Mm -hmm. That's real stuff, man. That's real stuff. <laughs> totally. I, and, and, and that kind of blows my brain. Cause you do, you're right. We do, we do spend our time on a lot of things that aren't bringing us the outcomes that we want. And so I, I love that begin with the end in mind um, and prioritize that. Um, because that's really what's going to bring you the greatest joy and happiness 
in the long run. And that's what we all want, right? We want to be happy. We want to feel love. Yeah. So, so anti-time management is a learnable skill and it's actually very simple. If anyone listening, just ask themselves, who do I want to be two years from now? When you know what you want to, who you want to be, you'll know what to do. So, you know, two years from now, where do I want to be professionally, personally, uh, with my people, with with play, things that I like, and then create projects around them. Oh, here's the things I'm going to do. This is how you bake it in from the start. And then eventually go, oh, here's how I'm going to get paid doing this. See, you can still get paid first by putting the business model of getting paid last. Most people say, I need to make money. Therefore, I'm going to move to a city I don't want to be in and spend the next 30 years here. Why? When they could have said, I want to live in this cool spot somewhere in the country, and I'm going to find a way to make money here. So the mm-hmm. idea in the book was build the castle, then the moat. The castle's the dream. The moat is how you work and how you get paid. That protects the dream. Most people start with the moat and never get out of it. Mm-hmm. And in reality, they've made their work their castle. But in reality, they're making their work to protect someone else's castle. Mm-hmm. And as soon as times get hard, they get fired, not by any problem or, or situation of their own, and then they feel lost. Why? Mm-hmm. Why when you could have done it differently? It's okay. When you put the castle first, you can live your values. And even when your projects or work don't work out, you still live without regret because you're living from your values, not towards them. It's so powerful. My goodness. Um, now, Richie, has there, has there been a scriptural that's been influential in your life as you have lived without regret? Not, not one that comes to mind like that. All of them. All of them. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that's awesome. So where can we go to find your new book, Anti-Time Management? Where is the best oh, place to buy you. that or, or the power starting something stupid or, or you? Tell us. Go, go to Amazon right now, type in Richie Norton or type in anti-time management and the book will pop up and you just buy it. If you go to richynorton.com, uh, I have some freebies there for you. You'll see me offering a 76 day challenge. Uh, you'll see me offering um, some a toolkit, you know, for, for t- anti-time management. And I can take you by the hand and help you turn your ideas into your reality step by step. Uh, but of course, everyone's situation is, is, is different. So the idea is to help you learn principles that you can apply uh, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. So yeah, go to richnorton.com, um, throw your email in there and uh, be happy to help you any way I can. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and teaching us a little bit, not only about your personal story and, and perhaps what taught you these principles, but also for being willing to put in the work to write an entire book about these concepts so that others too can prioritize what is most important to them and live with that same principle of no regrets. Thank you for your sacrifice in doing that. It's powerful. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're awesome. It's been really fun. It's been really fun. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, subscribe so you can get your weekly dose of powerful stories of hope. I know there are many of you out there who are going through a hard time, and I hope you found useful things that you can apply to your own life in today's podcast. If you would like to access the show notes of today's show, please visit my website, storiesofhopepodcast.com. There you will find a summary of today's show, the transcript, and one of my favorite takeaways. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this episode with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a quote or a scripture verse that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this podcast. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and he will help you bear the burden. And above all else, remember God loves you.